Hey guys, today's video is brought to you by Factor 75, your go-to choice for delicious, chef-crafted meals that take the hassle out of healthy eating. Let's kick things off by talking about convenience. Factor 75 is here to save you time and stress with their convenient meal delivery service. And here's the best part, Factor meals aren't just convenient, they're also designed to help you crush your fitness and wellness goals. Whether you're looking to build muscle, shed a few pounds, or simply maintain a balanced diet, Factor has you covered with their nutritious and delicious meals. But what really sets Factor apart is its flexibility. With customizable meal plans and options to fit your dietary needs, Factor 75 seamlessly adapts to your lifestyle. And trust me, if you're like me who's always too busy to cook, Factor will be a game changer for you. No more compromising on taste or nutrition with last minute takeout. Factor 75 delivers nutritious meals right to your door. Ready to take the hassle out of meal time? Get 50% off your first Factor box and free wellness shots for life using my link. That means you can choose two free wellness shots from three available flavors for every order while you are an active subscriber. Click the link in the description or scan the QR code with your phone. Thanks again to Factor 75 for sponsoring this video. I moved into my current house with my parents three years ago in 2006. Seems so long ago now that the number is in front of me. But you're not here to listen to me reminisce about times that have since passed. So I'll try my best to get right to the point without adding too much unnecessary stuff. My name is Alex, I'm 15 years old, and I've been trying to convince my parents that something is seriously wrong with our house. The first few years here were fine, nothing out of the ordinary. I had actually loved the place. My bedroom here was much bigger than the one at the old house, providing a lot more space for my gaming setup. But recently, within the last couple of months, I found something in our basement that I'm not entirely sure is actually as real as I think it is. Maybe I really am going crazy. Probably why my parents won't even bother to find out what I'm talking about. Good one, they tell me. You're being paranoid. I figured that if they weren't going to take my word for it, then I was gonna need to present them with some hard evidence of it. For both them and for anyone else who can do something about this. If they can do something about this. My parents had purchased me a camcorder for my 14th birthday. I had expressed some interest in film and video production. Up to this point, I had used it to create some amateur movies with friends from school, which were mainly just short clips of us walking through the woods, attempting to look frightening. Nonetheless, it being summer vacation helped me to be able to do this undisturbed. They more than likely assumed I'd be doing nothing but sitting in my room, playing video games anyway. Not that I blamed them in all honesty. Once I knew my parents had both left for work in the morning, I sprung up out of bed and grabbed my camcorder, not even realizing that I hadn't taken the time to get dressed first. So I merely slipped on a t-shirt along with my pajama pants and socks before beginning to head downstairs. I made sure to give every room above the basement a quick look through in order to make sure that I was the only one in the house at the time. After which, I stood at the basement door putting my hand on the knob and taking a deep breath. It wasn't that I was having second thoughts necessarily, but I considered things could potentially go wrong before deciding ultimately the risk was worth it to prove my claims. So I opened the door and took my first steps down the creaky stairs, reaching over to my right and hitting the switch to turn the basement light on. Our basement itself wasn't something to write home about. It was what you'd usually expect. A cold, brown painted, concrete floor and wall rectangular expanse with wood supports and insulin lining the ceiling. Old, dusty washing machines, piles of both dirty and freshly clean clothes in an assortment of different baskets. Cobwebs lining every corner of the room with centipedes worming their way underneath the cracks in the walls. I made it to the bottom of the stairs before taking a left and heading into the more recreational side of the basement. Although the only thing that truly made it recreational was a simple lawn chair and an old coffee table 
one that I'm sure hadn't been used in the past several months. Nonetheless, I soon made it to the thing I was talking about. The wall that was opposite the lawn chair and coffee table. Call me crazy, because in a minute, I'm sure you're going to be asking, what could be so wrong with a simple wall? Well, this wall, it was slightly darker than the rest. Even those immediately to both its right and left. It had this shadow that was eternally cast onto it, even when there wasn't a light source or object to create one. And sometimes it flickered, as if it were a light bulb. I've seen it happen before, and I saw it taking place yet again right before my eyes. The first few times it happened, I could have sworn it was just my imagination. But now, it was clear that my imagination had nothing to do with it. I thought that was the most strange part of this whole ordeal. I had come down to look at it before, but I thought the out-of-the-ordinary phenomena would end there. Until I got the balls to touch it. I mainly wanted to see if there was something that I was missing, that maybe it had something to do with the paint, or I just had something really wrong with my eyes. But that was just me trying to rationalize something I didn't understand. Because yesterday, I grabbed a broomstick and shoved it right up against the wall, expecting some paint to chip or some material to crumble. But no, instead, the broomstick simply went through the wall. I'm not sure how to describe it in an intellectual or detailed manner. It is as simple and as absurd as it sounds. My broomstick went through a solid concrete wall. I even walked forward with it in my hands at the time, and it continued going deeper in the wall, feeling no obstacles or objects stopping it. To make it clear, there were no holes, no cracks or breaches large enough to fit the width of the broomstick within. It was flat and smooth, and yet the broomstick sunk further in, as if it were lodged in quicksand. And then, after some careful but clearly not enough consideration, I put my hand up to the wall, and once my elbow disappeared, I pulled back. There was no pain, no extreme temperatures, no bugs, someone or something waiting to grab bite or claw me. It was just shocking in a way that made me only want to learn more. Maybe I just never noticed it before, but I could have sworn the wall had looked much more normal when we first moved in, not that I had spent very much time in the basement. Maybe I had no idea what I was talking about. Maybe I just hadn't truly paid enough attention to notice any changes. But last time, it was only my arm. This time, I was going to put the entirety of my body inside. I wanted to step through, to see what was on the other side of this wall. There was a part of me that even considered this to be some sort of hologram projection, and that somehow was less insane than it actually ended up being. But nonetheless, I'll always look back and see this as one of my most ill-informed acts, but the curiosity in me simply couldn't be contained. I needed answers. So, with my camcorder still in hand, I approached the wall, reaching out my hand yet again to make sure it was still passing through. And, as you can infer, the result was rather unsurprising. So after I took a deep breath and looked behind my shoulder at the rest of my basement, I stepped forward slowly my natural instincts telling me the wall was still solid, despite me vanishing further into it. But suddenly, I felt like I was being jerked forward and falling. The actual feeling of falling only lasted for less than half a second before I hit solid ground again with a thud. My camcorder fell out of my hand as I collided with what I assumed was another floor or wall. The texture under me felt rugged, like a carpet with a bit of moisture. I rubbed my head and opened my eyes, thinking I had fallen into a section of our house that I wasn't supposed to discover. But no, that wasn't it at all. What I saw when I looked up didn't make any sense. It didn't even seem possible. 
Part of me had wondered if I had accidentally inhaled a hallucinogen or something. In front of me was what I could only describe as a large, messily segmented and built set of rooms, hallways and corridors. All the walls were covered in this truly awful, bright yellow wallpaper that looked as if a small child had picked it out. It wasn't easy on the eyes in the slightest. I got myself to my feet, looking over to my right and seeing my camcorder on the ground, not broken and still recording. I leaned over and picked it up, putting it back in my hand, before immediately turning around to get a better bearing on my surroundings. How did I get here? Why was I here? What is this place? There were a million thoughts running through my head, and even though it was the last thing I wanted to do, I remained calm. That's what you always do in situations like this. You must remain calm. Panicking helps nothing and no one. It was quiet for the most part in this strange place, the only sound being a slight electric buzzing noise. It had an irritating hum to it, and I couldn't help but look up to find the origin of it, seeing a white tiled ceiling with poorly placed fluorescent lights running along it, most of which possessed a subtle flicker. Hello? I called out. Is anyone there? No response. So I ran up to one of the walls and started pushing on it. The moist carpet squelched a bit beneath my feet as I heaved myself forward in an attempt to pass through the wall as I had earlier, to no avail. I turned and dashed over to the wall behind me, pushing and shoving myself up against it. But it, like the other, was solid. I backed away from the wall coming to the conclusion that I needed to save my energy if I was going to get out of here anytime soon. And while I imagined many ways this could get worse, it didn't make it any easier to accept the fact that I was trapped. Trapped in this almost otherworldly sub-basement. So, I started by wandering down the nearest corridor to my left. It seemed to be around 200 feet long, with dozens of intersecting halls connecting to it on both the right and left walls. That same horrendous yellow wallpaper was consistent throughout. Even the humming and buzzing of the lights above followed me as I walked down the hallway. The fact that it was the only noise present in this building beside the squelching of moist carpet as I walked only further drove me up the wall. It was maddening in the most mundane yet most unsettling way possible. It's crazy how much humans rely on sound for comfort. Because... I had only been in this strange expanse for about a minute, and it had already felt like hours. Hello? I yelled once again, hoping for even a semblance of a response. Is anyone here? Can you hear me? Like the previous attempt, there was nothing in response, not a sound or sign of another human being. My breathing practically became twice as loud to make up for the dreadful silence. I soon encountered the end of the narrow corridor. I wandered into what appeared to be a much larger rectangular expanse. The basic design and layout were still the same, with multiple other corridors converging in the middle, kind of like an intersection. The lights flickered more heavily in the middle of the intersection, the humming and buzzing becoming almost unbearable. I don't know who approved the funding for this place, but they must have been out of their goddamn minds. I hadn't quite been able to come to a decision about which direction I should have gone at the intersection. All I know is that I wanted to get as far away as possible from that dang buzzing. I scoped out each hallway from where I stood with my eyes, with the one on the left catching my attention the most. Not because I was genuinely curious, but because it actually had something distinct going for it. And by distinct, I meant that it was dimmer than the other three with only one of the fluorescent lights in the entire visible length of it. But despite the poor lighting, I noticed something about halfway down its length. On the ground was what looked to be a piece of paper laid out, just a single sheet that contained text on it written in red ink. Being the only distinguishable proof of life or the presence of other human beings in this place, I began to creep down the corridor and approach it looking back over my shoulder with the undeniable feeling of being watched as I did so. I reached down, picking up the note as I made it over, only to make the unnerving discovery that the red ink wasn't ink at all. 
It was blood. I don't know how long I've been here, or how much longer I've got left. I'm scared. It feels like it's been days, and I haven't been able to find a way out. All I did was come home from work, throw myself into bed, and then here I was. Found this paper lying around in here, along with someone's car keys that were laying around. I had blood on them. I haven't seen another person since I got here. But I'm not alone here. There's something else lurking in these halls. And it isn't any man or woman. I gotta keep quiet. Stay low. Or whatever got the guy whose these keys belong to will come for me as well. To whoever finds this. If anyone finds this. Keep quiet. Stay low. And God help you if that thing hears you. I felt my heart sink into my stomach as I turned to look behind me, only to find nothing but the slight flickering of the lights yet again. But I was more than on edge. As crazy as it sounded, I believed every word that was written here. This wasn't some practical joke or prank. Even the most elaborate pranksters didn't have the resources for something like this. I can't count the number of times I've seen a horror movie where something that's obviously not a joke is treated like one by the protagonists. And guess what? They end up dead. There was no name or other information on the note. Ever since I was made aware that there might be something bloodthirsty lurking in here with me, the last thing I needed to do was carry around this note and have the smell of blood on me. So I left it, dropping it right at my feet, and began heading further down the corridor into a cylinder-shaped room. It was still more of the same, as far as design and architecture went. I took another deep breath preparing to head down the right corridor of the cylinder room. But before I could even move an inch, I heard a sound that made my blood freeze. The rest of me stayed right where I was by extension. The sound in question was a loud, ear-shattering screech that didn't sound all that far from behind me. I stood there, completely terrified, while my previous confidence quickly drained. I could only hope I wasn't seen by whatever it was. And I wasn't. Not yet, anyway. Once I mustered up the courage to finally turn around, I didn't see anything behind me. It was still the same yellow walls and moist carpet. And yet, it had somehow become more sinister than before. And that thing, was it what killed the person who wrote that note? Whatever this being was, I could now hear it getting closer. Its footsteps were quick and frantic, so I picked up the pace a bit. My slow march turned into a brisk stroll. I couldn't help but feel like my heart was going to explode out of my chest from the threat the situation filled me with. I made a left turn, and then another, before booking it down a white corridor, before making a right. This place really was a nonsensical maze. The architecture made absolutely no sense. But I refused to let this yellow wasteland become my grave. The creature shrieked again, but this time the tone was slightly changed, now sounding a bit more celebratory and more triumphant, as if it had accomplished something that it exacted joy from. It was only once I heard what came next that I understand why. No, 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 no! came the desperate, horrified screams of what sounded like an adult man who knew he was about to meet a truly awful fate. I couldn't pinpoint exactly which hallway or room the chaos was coming from. All I know is that it wasn't more than 30 to 40 feet away. Regardless, I wasn't intending to play hero against some creature I hadn't even seen the appearance of. Stop! Stop! No! The man began to cry out, only to be cut off by his own shriek, accompanied by the sound of bone snapping and flesh tearing. His cries soon became gurgled, only lasting a few seconds before he was drowned out by the sound of aggressive snarling and growling. At this point, I was sprinting, tears of both stress and fear forming in my eyes. I quickly raised my fingers up in order to wipe them away and keep them from blurring my vision as I ran. I eventually found a tight, almost closet-sized space at the end of one of the hallways. I didn't hesitate to slip inside and get myself out of sight as soon as humanly possible. Once in, 
I headed to the corner furthest from the opening, sat down, put my knees to my chest before shoving my face in my arms and taking surprising care not to be too loud, lest I want to try that thing over and then really have something to cry about. I could only think about how I really might die here, that I'll be the next victim of whatever that monster is. If there were more people that were alive and trapped in this, whatever this place is, then I have to try and find them and make a plan to get out of here once and for all. I let myself stare into the darkness of this crevice as I sat there with the illusion of safety, all still in more terror than ever. I only now just realized I dropped my camcorder in all of the chaos of my reacting and running. But most of me honestly didn't care. Proving a point wasn't worth it the moment I fell into this place. I should have left the wall alone. I should have just minded my own damn business and not poked my nose where it shouldn't have been. As helpless as I felt, I know my idiotic actions had a part to play in the predicament I found myself in. But I was here now, and I had to grapple with the reality of the last intelligent moves I made. If I was going to get out of here alive, the last thing I needed to do was to sit here and mentally check out. I needed to be on my toes and alert. So, once I mustered the strength to stand back up, I did just that. I was still no superhero or brave soldier, but I was someone who wanted to survive. Someone who wanted to live to share a story I'm sure most would not believe. I quietly walked over to where I had entered this small den, turning to peek my head through the shiny opening in the larger hallway. But I immediately froze when I heard footsteps. Footsteps that weren't heavy or slow, but abundant and quick, as if whatever was moving was moving on far more than just two limbs. They were coming from down the corridor to my left. I could make out the fact that whatever it was, it was going to turn the corner any second. I retreated back into the den and got as far away from the opening as was physically possible. But, but my morbid curiosity as to whatever I was trapped in this maze with couldn't be contained. It just brutally killed someone, so any sort of negotiating or attempting to reason with it was out of the question. All I could do was sit there and wait as it began to walk down the hallway, approaching closer and closer to the den. Once again, its footsteps were soft, yet horrendously abundant. It sounded more like scurrying. It had this almost tapping-like rhythm that made my skin crawl, like a spider the size of a dog running down a hallway. I held my breath as it approached, only letting myself exhale when absolutely necessary. I didn't dare poke my head out the entrance or attempt to get a direct look at it. But the shape of its shadow on the wall behind the den opening did more than enough to make sure I never forgot this experience for the rest of my life. The lowest part of its body looked to be composed of at least a dozen thin but long limbs that all moved in unison with one another in a twisted, uncanny manner like a centipede that had been sloppily stitched together. Above that set of horrific legs was a long rectangular frame, with dozens more bent and thin limbs protruding from each side of it. I couldn't even tell if this thing had a head, definitely not one that I could make out with the shadow. Who in their right mind would keep a monstrosity like this in here? Was it locked up? Did it kill the people keeping it contained and get out? Is that why this place is abandoned? Even if I did have the answers to all those questions, it still doesn't explain the fact that it seems like I'm far from the only average person to end up trapped in here. It really was something out of a child's nightmare. Anyone's nightmare in all honesty. It stopped only feet in front of the entrance to my den. I prayed to every god I could think of, hoping it wouldn't detect or sense me. The creature, whatever it was, let out a low growl a far departure from the pitch of sounds it was making previously. I could feel it vibrate the wall my back was against as I held my breath. Even if I wanted to make a sound, I couldn't. No noise could escape me. My terror was busy holding it in. It seemed to turn side to side, as if in the middle of looking for something. But the creature didn't move in either of those directions. Instead, choosing to continue to move forward, and turned the corner down another hall, allowing me to live to see another day, for the time being. I made an escape while I had the chance, 
busting out of the entrance to the tent and immediately making a mad dash for the left in the lightest footsteps possible. Nearly right after turning the corner, I spotted my camcorder on the floor at the far end of the hall. It had been smashed, with dozens of broken off pieces all over the area surrounding it. All the footage and proof I had were gone. I wasn't aware at the time if there was some way to extract or salvage anything off of it. I could only wonder how pissed my friends would be when I tell them all those short films we created using that thing are toast. But there wasn't much time to mourn the loss of my hard work, so I kept moving. When I made it back to the cylinder room this time, I chose a different path to go down. The last thing I needed was to go anywhere besides the total opposite direction of where that thing was headed. I was now more alert than ever as I tracked through this nonsensical expanse, aware that there was far worse waiting for me in these walls than simple starvation or severe loneliness as a result of isolation. In all honesty, I've always loved my privacy and being away from others, but not like this. There was more of the same everywhere I went. Yellow walls, white ceiling, and smelly moist carpet. The hum buzz of the lights became a background song at a certain point. I had just accepted the reality that it wasn't gonna stop anytime soon. Regardless, I took three left turns, then three right ones before heading straight for what felt like nearly a quarter of a mile and taking another left. I thought that I was surely leaving the creature in the dust, that it would never find me in this endless maze. But as I was dashing down one of the corridors, I noticed something at the end that caught my eye. Something that I thought might be my ticket out of here, my saving grace. So I slowed down, let myself take in a few deep breaths, and tried to get my heartbeat back to a more reasonable speed. I then looked back over at what had my attention making out what looked to be two thin, long objects protruding out from the ceiling. The distance made it difficult for me to make out details in the shapes, but the colors consisted of a dark blue for the majority of these objects' lengths, with them ending in a light brown towards the bottom. Please, I whispered out. Please let this be it. My predictions were genuinely optimistic. I thought that I'd been able to climb my way out of these walls, and be free. But as I got closer, so did the reality of what these so-called objects actually were. It had got to a point where I was only around seven or eight footsteps away from these things, and as I looked up, my bottom jaw hung ajar. They were legs, human legs, legs which protruded from a section of the ceiling where the tile had been removed. Although from the looks of it, it was more like violently torn and or busted off. I had morbidly assumed the rest of the corpse was laying along the other tiles within the ceiling. How did I know it was a corpse? Well, it definitely wasn't just a pair of jeans and old boots the legs were covered in, but a foul stench as well. A stench that was irrefutably rot in decay. One that I had only ever experienced when walking near dead animals in the woods near my house. Except here, it had been cranked up to eleven. I threw my left hand over my nose, fighting the urge to lose my lunch as I looked up in horror. There I was, standing just several feet underneath a pile of rotting meat that was once a fellow human being. A fate that could have just as easily become mine if I didn't get lucky. But... What could have possibly done this? Did the creature chasing me possess the ability to scale surfaces? Its anatomy seems to suggest that might be the case. And if it didn't, then that means there was something else I had to watch out for in this maze, the thought of which did nothing to help me feel any better. Eventually, the vomit that had risen its way into my throat had overpowered my efforts to keep it inside. I took my hand away opened my mouth, and all over the wall it went, while the smell of rot continued pounding its way into my nostrils. I had to turn back, to get away from it as soon as possible, but just as I regathered myself enough to start running and finding a new way to go, the sound of many rapid footsteps in succession made me quickly rethink my actions. 
I slammed the brakes on harder than I ever had before as I heard them coming from around the corner closest to my left. That thing. It was coming back. Coming back for me. And I'm sure the smell of the body directly above me didn't help much either. I stood there, frozen like the terrified moron I was. Truthfully, there was a part of me that wanted to give up and accept my fate. To let this hell on earth, or whatever this was, kill me and get it over and done with. But that quickly dissipated once I saw one of that thing's legs begin to wrap around the corner at the end of the hallway I was looking at. It was a grotesque, black, almost asphalt-like color. A bit of blood staining the tip that also stained the wallpaper. My fight, or more precisely, flight instincts kicked into gear. I didn't bother sticking around to get a better look at what I knew was a truly horrifying appearance. I turned and ran once more, reaching the opposite end of the hallway in mere seconds before immediately making a sharp left turn into another. I heard the creature let out a blood-chilling screech as it gave chase, those many legs stampeding along the carpet and walls as it pursued me relentlessly. Any effort to be subtle or quiet was now in vain. I made a few more random turns, both left and right, hoping to confuse the beast. But my efforts seemed to be pointless, and I was still within its line of sight despite what I had done to get out of it. I huffed and wheezed as I looked for anything. Anything that could take me to a higher or lower elevation. Stairs? An elevator? A ladder? Because I was more than sure I would fall victim to fatigue long before my pursuer did. After a few more twists and turns, endlessly trying to make myself as elusive as possible, I began to slow down as my exhales became quicker. My face went red and sweat began to drench my face. A stitch in my sight began to form as well. I knew that I was doomed if I didn't find anything soon. I truly thought that things couldn't have gotten any worse than the terrifying sequence in which I was currently trapped. But this strange dimension had an excellent way of proving me wrong. Without looking, I made another left as I heard the creature shriek yet again behind me, alerting me that it was still in hot pursuit. I tried my best to keep my pace as I dashed down the hallway I had just turned into looking at the floor for a few seconds as my muscles ached and cried out for mercy. Even the adrenaline couldn't keep me going forever. When I looked up, however, I was met with the sight of a dead end. No turns or other corridors. There was no way to go but the way I came. I was only several feet in front of the wall that cut me off. I tried to turn and make a mad dash back the way I came, only for the creature to leap out from around the corner and cut me off forcing me to stumble backward and abandon my decision as I fell right on my ass. Its centipede-like legs wrapped around the wall once again as they reached forward. The creature then begins to move its body from around the corner, revealing more of its appalling appearance to me as I crawled backward in utter disgust. Saying it looked like a mutant centipede would be an insult to such a creature. I had trouble believing even God himself could conjure up such a monstrosity. The entity's skin was a dark, near pitch black tone of color, with jagged streaks of dirty white patterns running along it that looked more like scars than any sort of natural anatomical patterns. When the beast stood to attention, it had to be well over seven feet, absolutely dwarfing me, as if I were a toddler in the presence of a grown man. The entire perimeter of its actual body had those thin limbs protruding from it, all of them moving in unison with each other. Once again, a few of them still possessed blood on their tips, who I'm assuming belonged to the man I heard die screaming earlier on. The body of the creature was a sharp, rectangular shape. It mostly lacked features, save for the giant gaping hole towards the top, which I had concluded to be its mouth. One without any teeth, just a pitch black, void-esque hole. This thing knew it had me cornered. Each end of its mouth contorted in a fashion as if it were trying to smile at me, but it just about lacked the necessary muscle structure to do so. Regardless, it made me want to know that I was trapped, as it's mercy for it to kill me in a gruesome, agonizing manner. I was going to become its plaything, and its food. I still had some self-preservation left over, despite the rational part of my brain telling me there was nothing I could do. 
but I managed to get to my feet nonetheless, beginning to back up as the creature slowly lurched forward, dozens of its limbs all moving in tandem with each other. Please, I announced softly, holding my hands out in front of my face as I continued backing up while my legs trembled. And just as I was expecting myself to hit the wall that was behind me, my body, I felt my body suddenly jerk backward, as if I had just been yanked by something powerful. I yelped as my back impacted what felt like a hard carpet surface. And suddenly, things weren't nearly as bright. I pulled my hands away from my face, revealing an entirely new environment around me. A library, just a plain old library. The walls were just a plain light brown color. The ceiling was tiled, and there were fluorescent lights, but they weren't buzzing or flickering. The carpet itself didn't feel moist either, just like regular everyday carpet that was actually maintained. I coughed for a few seconds, trying to comprehend what had just occurred in a fury of confusion. But it clicked soon enough. I had passed through the wall, the same way I had passed through the one that had me end up in that yellow-colored death trap in the first place. But doesn't that mean the creature could follow me? That single question made me quickly tense my muscles as I prepared to throw myself up to my feet, only to be stopped halfway by the comforting sound of an older woman's voice. Are you okay, young man? I turned, seeing several different people all around the library with their eyes on me. Some in lounge chairs, some at a desk in front of computers, and some standing next to shelves with books in hand. I caught a glimpse of the woman who had spoken, who I guessed correctly to be on the older side, with long grey hair, wrinkly skin, and dressed in a button shirt and khakis with a pair of thin glasses on. What? This is home, right? I said, letting out a few more coughs. Everyone shared glances with each other, more than likely thinking I was in some sort of state of delusion. The older woman informed me that she hadn't seen me enter the library, that everyone had heard a sudden thud, and there I was, sprawled out on the floor and coughing, so she came over to see if I was okay. Police were contacted to come and take me home. I obliged, wanting to make everything as easy as possible after what I had just gone through. But during everything that transpired, the library staff making the call, my parents talking with the officers, all I could think about was that place. And that thing. You see, what made it even more confusing was the fact that I entered that place several hours before my parents were supposed to arrive home. Yet, I could have sworn my whole ordeal there lasted no longer than an hour, and I was never knocked unconscious or asleep at any point. Nonetheless, I'm now writing this to try and make sense of what happened to me. But I don't think that'll ever truly happen. I'm sure no one will really believe my story, but it helps to get it out there anyway. For my own sanity, I have my first appointment with my new therapist next week. Not by choice either, therapy has never really been my thing. But I guess that's what happens when you ramble to your parents about getting stuck in a different dimension and running from mutant creatures with impossible anatomy. Not that I'll even attempt to tell her any of that, although I'm sure my parents might do it for me when first meeting her. But. If I've learned anything from all this, it's that I'll never, and I mean never, go near that wall again. It's been about three months since my whole incident with the expense. I had been seeing my new therapist, Tiffany, for pretty much that entire length of time. She was on the younger side and had only really been working in the field for a few years but she seemed to know what she was doing and actually listened to me. I told her a lot of stuff and experiences in my life up to that point, but I mostly veered away from the topic of the expense. Wasn't trying to get myself committed. I don't really know how that whole thing works. It just feels like the more I went into it, the better the chance I would have of her thinking I was legitimately insane. Hyperbole aside though, I just thought it would be better 
for the both of us if I didn't bring it up much. That is, until one day, she insisted that I talk about it. She wasn't authoritative, necessarily, but said everything she could to guarantee I would feel okay with going into detail about it. After all, me trying to tell others about it is why I was here in the first place. Alex, you can trust me. I'm here to help you, not judge you. If I was, then I wouldn't be in this chair. She said softly, leaning forward in her chair and looking at me with almost maternal instinct. I won't force you to talk about anything, but I promise you don't have to feel like a prisoner in your own mind. I'll bet I can relate a lot more than you might think. I perked up upon hearing that last sentence, my eyes shifting in her direction with a look of intrigue and curiosity. She returned the eye contact before delivering a slight smirk, confirming her implication. You're not serious, I accused. Listen, I get you want to help me, but you don't have to lie to do it. This isn't necessarily the most professional of me, and I really shouldn't say this, but that place you're talking about, it's not as insane as you might think. I believe your story, every word of it. She continues, suddenly stopping her hand gestures as she waits for my response. I really don't appreciate you making a joke out of my experience. I snarled. You're supposed to be helping me. You're supposed to be different than all the other people who won't listen and ridicule me. I'm nothing but a punchline to everyone, even before any of this happened. After my little fit, I then got up out of my chair and began to walk to the door, only to be stopped once she announced something that made my heartbeat nearly cease upon hearing it. The thing with all the legs came her calm assertion. I turned, looking over to her with wide eyes and mouth slightly ajar. I had never told her about the creature, not once. In fact, I hadn't told anyone about it, let alone any of its anatomical features. So I stood there, looking like a complete moron, while she got out of her chair and approached me, taking a quick glance to her left at a long curtain on the side of the room with no windows, and then directly back at me. It tried to kill you, didn't it? She inquired rhetorically. It tried to kill me too. Still, I stood there stunned, not even knowing how to form words for a response. Alex, you gotta believe me. I'm sorry if you thought I was trying to discredit you. That wasn't my intention. But I know what you're talking about. I know you're not the only person who's gone through this. Now, will you please sit and finish our session? I don't want you leaving this room upset. She kept her gaze locked hard on me, and I took a deep breath, internally kicking myself for not keeping my cool when I had always been a person who prided myself on doing just that. So, with a bit of hesitance, I turned and headed back over to my chair, sitting back down and cupping my hands together as I waited for her to continue speaking. How did you get in? Like, how did you get there? She asks, a sympathetic undertone present in her voice. It took nearly a full minute to answer, despite knowing precisely what I wanted to say. But Tiffany's body language gave me no doubt that she was entirely prepared to listen. A wall, I croaked out. This wall in my basement. It was like it wasn't even there. Like things could just go through it. It was so weird. I've only seen things like that in video games. This didn't seem to shock her, not in the slightest. Instead, she only nodded slightly while staying silent, allowing me to elaborate. My parents wouldn't listen to me. I tried telling them about it, but they never wanted to hear it. All I know is that I wanted some proof, you know, so I could show someone, someone who could do something about it. Or at least, someone who would believe me. How did you feel while you were in there? She asked prompting me to take another several seconds of silence as I thought of my reply. I... I really don't know how to explain it. It's not a feeling you can describe. I don't think anyone's felt it. Besides you. Is there any chance you could tell me about what you saw in the walls? I solicit, only to prompt a look of hesitance from Tiffany. 
This is about you, Alex. Not me. I'm here to hear your story, not to tell mine. She rebuts, cupping her hands together. I know. I know you are. But I want to hear yours. Maybe, just maybe, it'll help me be able to find some closure with mine. I fire back, more insistent than previously. I just want to know there's someone else out there who understands. Tiffany exhales, looking to both her right and her left, only to return her gaze back over to me as silence swallows the room. I knew that in the back of her mind, she did want to tell me that despite her training and education, she was still human at the end of the day. Screw protocols. Screw procedures. Screw all of it. Just please, please tell me. I beg, leaning forward in anticipation. Tiffany keeps eye contact with me, still appearing unsure about her next move. I widen my eyes and let her know just how desperate I was to hear about her experience. Okay. She sighs, still hesitant. I was ten. It was my birthday and my mom had invited several of my friends over to the house to celebrate. My dad had taken me out to the shed in our backyard so he could grab tools to finish working on my birthday present. He refused to tell me what it was until it was finished. You see, my dad never really let me into the shed very much, not unless I was close to him. Said he didn't want me messing with grown-up stuff in there, stuff that could hurt me. She paused, allowing me to interject with a question. What was your dad's job? I inquire, surprisingly prompting her to smile. He was a carpenter. He was always very good with his hands. Tiffany trails off, an expression of guilt creeping onto her face. Alex, are you sure you want me to do this? It just doesn't feel right. Yes, I need this. Okay. Well, we went into the shed, and it was a very small shed could barely fit three people inside there at once. There was a door on the opposite end of the entrance door. It looked like it would lead you somewhere in the back of the shed, but there wasn't any more physical structure behind it to give the door a real purpose for being there. It was about as pointless as a window on the floor. Dad grabbed some of his tools, and I just kept staring right at that door the whole time. I had seen it a couple of times before, but on this particular occasion, I just really wanted to know why it was there. So I asked him. He told me he was going to add onto the shed and that he wanted to have the door built ahead of time. Of course, me being 10 with not much comprehension of how carpentry works, I took that answer at face value. Yet, there was also this part of me that felt like he wasn't telling the whole truth. After the party was over that night and I had gone to bed, I couldn't sleep. I laid awake all night thinking about that door. I don't know why, even at the time I knew it was an odd thing to focus on. Nonetheless, it didn't leave my mind. I tossed and turned. I had a long day with a lot going on, and yet I was still wide awake. And it was all because of that damn door. There was another few brief moments of silence, as Tiffany turned to look at that curtain on the side of the room again, causing me to do the same as she started speaking once again. At one point, it got to be too much. I was just way too curious about something so mundane. Like I said, I don't know why. But I got out of bed, grabbed my flashlight, and made my way out to the shed. I made sure not to wake Dad up. Not even sure how long I would have gotten grounded for if I ended up getting caught. I make it to the shed regardless and walk over to the door. And with the only other sound in the immediate area being crickets, I was able to hear something on the other side of it, which logically should have just been more crickets. But it wasn't. Instead, it sounded like electric buzzing, if that even makes any sense. Like the buzzing of ceiling lights. Even at that age, I knew that something wasn't right. I recognized the sound from the lights in my school at the time, and I knew there was no reason for me to be hearing it coming from there. I let my curiosity get the best of me as a lot of kids do. So I opened that damn door. God, I just want to kick myself for even saying it now. But I opened the door, and there it was. The expanse. I remember it 
just like how you described it. Ugly yellow walls, a damp and old looking carpet, and the buzzing. It was twice as loud now that I had opened the door. I didn't know what to think. I knew that I was scared. Part of me was anyway, but I was mainly in shock. This was impossible. I had only seen things like this happening in the cartoons and movies I watched. I told myself I wouldn't go far, that I would only take a few steps inside just to see what the place was and make sure it wasn't just my imagination and that I wasn't just dreaming. At first, I honored what I told myself. I only took three steps inside before staring at the empty hallway in front of me. The fluorescent lights flickering above only helped to unease me, but my curiosity was overpowering my gut feeling, the feeling that something was wrong, and not just with what I could see. I finally began listening to my instincts at that point, because it wasn't long before I decided it was really time to go and that I had already overstayed my welcome. When I turned around to go back the way I came, I saw nothing. Just a flat, ugly yellow wall like the rest of them. Any sign of the door being there just up and vanished. I went up to the wall, pushed on it with all my weight, threw myself against it over and over, thinking I'd get some sort of different outcome. But no, I was just a scared little girl trapped in a place I knew nothing about. I banged on the wall and yelled as loud as I could for my parents. Wasn't long before I started to cry in a desperate panic. All I did was stand there, continuously throwing my fists on the wall over and over and begging for my parents to come save me from this place. And it wasn't long before something hurt me. Something that knew I was invading its territory. I heard it screech when it was coming for me. It was awful. Don't think I've ever heard anything more horrific than the sounds that thing made. It was like someone had put a screaming baby on a distorted megaphone. So, I did the only thing I could do at the time. I ran, ran as fast as I could to the right, because the screeching was coming from the left. It felt like, I don't know, like I wasn't even moving. I passed yellow wall after yellow wall. I knew in the back of my mind I was going somewhere, but the rest of me felt deceived. It looked endless and maddening. Eventually, I came to a stop feeling like I had put enough distance between myself and whatever it was that had been pursuing me. What I felt wasn't just fear. This wasn't looking down a dark flight of stairs or a creepy basement or seeing a spider in your room. No, this was existential on a level I can't put into concrete wording. I still hadn't seen the thing, not up to that point. So I went and hid behind a wall, placed my back against it so softly. I couldn't even tell if I had actually made contact with it. It was around 10 seconds when I was able to work up the courage to pick my head over the edge of the wall. I was shaking, holding in sniffles, had silent tears going down my face. I didn't dare make a sound. I couldn't afford to. At first, there was nothing. It kind of looked like something out of one of those old playhouses from the 2000s. Just cold, empty, no life present at all. It was uncanny. Tiffany pauses, inhaling and shifting her gaze over towards that curtain once more, prompting me to finally point it out. What's going on with that? I asked as politely as I could. Oh, nothing important, just more wall. She laughed off dismissively. For the first time since she started her story, I felt a bit uncomfortable but I mainly chalked it up to her being invested in what she was saying, so I went back to just listening. There I was, staring down that yellow void, until I hear it screech again as it rounds the corner all the way down the hall and spots me peeking. I knew it saw me because we both froze for a second, like it wanted me to know that it knew I was there and that my fate was sealed. All oh, those legs, God, those legs. They all moved in this grotesquely perfect unison as it started running towards me. So I turned and bolted, hugging the wall to my left, which was a dead end. Just my luck. Did I mention I don't like spiders? Or really anything more than four legs for that matter. So it wasn't exactly on my bucket list to encounter a man-sized mutated centipede. 
didn't think my little legs could carry me so far and so fast. Everything around me was a blur, like I was on a high-speed rail train or something. But it still wasn't enough. That thing was hot on my trail, and there was a small part of me that knew I couldn't outrun it. I pulled away from the wall to my left, took some turns to try and confuse it. But it knew what I was doing. Probably because everyone who ran from it before tried the same thing and failed. God have mercy on them. I knew it was closing in on me when its footsteps got louder. Death was practically knocking at my door. I still remember how it sounded when it ran. Makes my skin crawl to this day. The yellow walls, the hum buzz of the lights, the old moist carpet. It made it that much worse, knowing I was probably going to die young in such an alien environment. I wasn't getting out, not alive anyway. Or so I thought. She trailed off. You said the wall in your basement was how you entered it, right? The expanse? She inquires, catching me off guard with the sudden question. Yes. I trailed off, unsure what to say next. Why didn't you try to show anyone? My parents, they built a wall of wood panels in front of it, told me they were tired of my ghost stories and my obsession with that damn wall. So they said they'd get it out of my sight and out of my mind. I think they know there's something wrong with it, kinda like how your dad did. But they don't want me messing with things I don't understand. Or they just didn't want our house to become a government research site. Both seem just as likely. I wish they would at least acknowledge my story as true. Their own son went to this horrific place, survived being attacked by a dangerous monster, and they just pretend like I'm crazy that I'm just desperate for attention. I hate it, and I almost hate them for it, but they have raised me, fed me, and given me shelter. Maybe one day they'll come to their senses. Tiffany's stare became a bit more cold, as if I had just told her what I ate for breakfast that morning. I hadn't seen her ever look at me like that before now. I didn't like it. It was unsettling, especially considering the gravity and context of what I had just said. Why don't you finish telling me about your experience? We're kind of getting off topic, don't you think? I interject, hoping that she would agree. Right. She began, bringing me a bit of relief. It's about as straightforward as a situation like that could be. I was running from something that I truly couldn't escape in a place I was never meant to be. Eventually, after going for so long, my lungs began to give out. I simply couldn't muster the strength or energy to run anymore even though I knew I had no choice. And I think that was the worst part of it all, knowing that I couldn't even do the bare minimum of running away to save myself. Sure as hell wasn't going to try and fight that thing. Soon enough, I came to a dead end, boxed in by walls on either side of me and the creature behind me. I somehow mustered the courage to turn around as it closed in. I could have sworn it even tried to smile at me before it prepared to kill me. Like it knew what it was doing, was going to make me suffer, and that it was going to take pleasure in the agony of my slow painful death. But something in me snapped, and I honestly shocked myself when this sudden shouting roar emerged from within me, and I directed it right at the creature. I thought it would be completely pointless, but to my surprise, it hesitated, like it was caught off guard by a violent outburst of what it saw as prey. Leave me alone, you stupid ugly monster, I shouted while flailing my arms. I noticed that it had been taken aback and I wanted to keep it that way. You're a stupid, weird and ugly monster, I continued screaming, baring my teeth to make myself look less docile. It wasn't long before the beast had realized who was really in control, so it began crawling forward again despite me throwing my various insults at it. I was desperate saying every nasty thing I could think of as it closed the distance. But like I said, my dominance was short-lived. I wasn't in control any longer. So, I tried something else. I... I proposed a deal... to it. Tiffany then pauses, not even making a sound, as she looked at the floor with mannerisms that almost resembled guilt. What? What did you offer it? I grilled, demandingly. 
That's not important. But what is, is that it spoke to me, told me it was hungry, in this gross, hoarse, and nightmarish voice, like an elderly smoker who had his throat filled with a thick syrup. I didn't even know something that alien could even possess the ability to speak in the first place. Its voice really contrasts with all those horrible screeches it makes, I'll tell you that. But I eventually made it out, found a wall that was darker than the rest, and fell right through. Ended up right back up in, Whoa, whoa, wait, what did you offer it? I said, less patience present in my tone. And don't say it's not important, I want to know why it let you live. But Tiffany doesn't respond out loud. Instead, she goes looking at that freaking curtain again, giving it an intriguing stare before standing up out of her chair and moving towards it. That's when I decided it was time to leave. I think this session is over, I pronounced as firmly as I could at the time, only for her entire demeanor to shift once the words left my mouth. I stood up, attempting to go over and grab my cell phone from her table. Sit! She snarled, giving me a look that said she was not in any mood to argue. Tell me what you offered it! I erupted, my voice echoing off the walls. She didn't respond yet again, prompting me to lunge for the door. I got my hand on the knob and fumbled to turning it, so I threw it on there again, only to be stopped mid-turn by the sound of a click coming from behind me. I already concluded the obvious. Stop. Turn around slowly. Don't make this any harder than it needs to be. She growled, presumably waving the gun she had pointed at the back of my skull. You know, I'd rather die than get sent back there. I rebut. Oh, it won't be that simple. I'll just put a bullet in each of your knees and then throw you in there. So your fate is up to you. Do you want to die slow and painfully, or have a chance of running away for a while? I put my hands up and slowly turn around. And right there is the sight of Tiffany standing next to the curtain, with a clock in her right hand pointed directly at me. Good, she muttered, just before reaching with her free hand to grab the edge of the curtain and yank it to the side. And behind said curtain was a door. Just a simple, dark red door, like one you'd see in someone's home. That alone isn't usually very sinister, but in this context, it was beyond bone chilling. I knew what was on the other side of it, and that I didn't have much longer before I ended up back there, back in the expanse. Come here, Tiffany demanded, using her gun to point to the door. With no choice, I did as I was told, marching over to her and stopping just a meter in front of the door my hand still in the air. It's hungry. I'm sorry, Alex, but it's hungry, she said, all the sympathy exiting her tone. When I saw your story, I knew that I needed to find you. So you can kill me? To continue to save your own skin? How do you know the creature could even make it out of the expanse? What do you have to fear? It's nothing but an empty threat when you're out here. Oh, it... It can, she stuttered. You see, you got lucky. You fell into a public space where it didn't want to reveal itself by continuing to pursue you. But most people, even those who fall back into reality, aren't so lucky. How would it even know where you are when you're not in the expanse? You don't have to bend to this thing's will, I promise you. But instead of rebutting, she simply waves the gun toward the door, signaling for me to open it and step through. I can't take the risk. I need to look out for myself. People were never meant to discover the expense, and we're both paying the price for treading somewhere we don't belong. Plus, if I don't hold up my end of the bargain, I'm not the only one in danger. Far from it. This goes beyond just me and you. Seems like you're getting a bit of slack compared to me. I barked back. Hurry up and stop stalling. Tiffany snapped. There's no need to do this. There's gotta be another way. I bet you haven't even tried to use that gun on it once, have you? I said go Alex, she commanded violently, now moving closer and placing the barrel inches away from my skull. I turned, slowly, giving her one last look, a look that told her that I was desperate for her to come to her senses. All I wanted was for her to realize the madness of what she was doing, and that there was a way out. 
But alas, I was hoping for an outcome that was impossible at that point. So I took a deep breath, looked ahead, and lifted my hand up, guiding it over to the doorknob. You're going to get what's coming to you, I said, maintaining my forward gaze despite my defeated tone. I then slowly pulled back, the door creaking as it inched across the distance of the floor. My eyes widened as I saw it, the place I thought I'd never see again. All my fight or flight instincts went into high alert as soon as I heard the buzzing of the fluorescent lights. Everything that happened came right back to me in a way that made me feel like I never truly left the expanse. It was like getting a greeting from my own personal hell welcoming me back home. I took my first couple steps forward, the all too familiar but subtle squelch of the moist carpet manifesting as my foot made contact. I felt goosebumps form around my arms and legs. The expanse was a bit cooler than what I had previously remembered. It's for the greater good, came Tiffany from behind. I don't turn around, not at first, but once I hear a heavy slam, I take a look back, seeing nothing but more of the ugly yellow wallpaper. It was just like Tiffany's experience, if she was even telling the truth. The door that leads in does not lead out. But just like that, I was right back in the place I dreaded most. But I wouldn't make the same mistakes I did last time. The first thing I wanted to do was begin searching for a wall. A wall that I could fall through in order to get out of here. I also wanted to pinpoint wherever the creature might have been. That way, I could take steps to avoid it. I needed to keep quiet, to not panic like I did the first time around. And if I was careful enough, I knew I just might survive long enough to make it out once more. I then started walking in a crouched formation, turning right and heading down a corridor that led to a dead end, only to turn and take another left once reaching the end, and immediately feeling off-put by the sight I had laid eyes upon. At the end of the hall was what looked like to be a four-way intersection of rooms, which by itself was nothing new. I had seen things like this the first time I was here. However, there was a strange, bright light being emitted from something in the opening of the hallway on the right. I kept quiet and glanced around me, looking for any signs of the creature's presence, as I considered moving to investigate whatever was causing the disproportionate light effect. And in that moment... I discovered nothing. However, I did hear something. Something that completely threw me off. First, it was a sudden slam, as if a heavy door had been opened and closed in quick succession. Then, that same slam was followed by the sound of footsteps and human voices, both male and female. I turned back and hugged the wall to my right for cover and get down as low as I can getting all the way up to where it ended and laying on my stomach while peeking over to see whoever these people were. Just in front of the now invisible door were three individuals, all of which looked like they just walked straight out of an episode of some shadowy government conspiracy TV show. There were two women and one man, the three of which were dressed near head to toe in black with all sorts of body armor and gear to go with it. Each of them held a rifle in their hands with a pistol on their utility belt, along with various other non-firearm weapons, like grenades and knives. The man then puts a hand near his left ear, fidgeting with what appeared to be some sort of earpiece for communication, becoming visibly frustrated as he struggled to get it to function properly. Believe me, I wanted nothing more than to run up to them and tell them everything, tell them to help me find a way out of this godforsaken place and show them the horrors these walls hold and who was responsible for putting me in here. But I don't think they were there to help, considering the fact that one of them had Tiffany's clock strapped to their side, with a bit of blood sitting on the side of the barrel. She was nowhere to be found, and I pondered as to whether or not she was dead or incapacitated. But it wasn't long before I got my answer. The body's getting picked up and taken to Site 7. Their director of operations said so came the man, his voice soft but low in pitch. Why not take it back to Site 12, then they can feed her to that blue freak they got locked up in there, rebuts one of the women in a sarcastic tone. He's got a talent for killing, I'll give him that, 
the other woman chimes in. But man, West wasn't kind to him in the looks department. I bet you've never even seen him fight. The man jokes, smirking as he clutches his rifle. One of the women opens her mouth to form a reply, only to be cut off by a blood-curdling, ear-shattering screech coming from somewhere to the far left of us. The three of them all immediately snap to attention and raise their weapons, ready for a fight. The creature, it knew we were here, and it was coming. The man quickly lifts a hand to his ear again, resting two fingers against it, before saying, This is Agent Crete with Team X5-2. We're at the location, and the witness has been terminated and pinged for pickup and disposal. May or may not be cryptid activity present as well. Should we keep moving? The three, agents, all stood at attention as they received their response. One that I myself was too far to hear coming from the communication piece. I arrived at the conclusion that it was now my time to leave, so I got to my feet as quietly as possible, still hugging the wall as I slowly backed away. I turned and refocused my attention to the corridor, peering down at the intersection and setting my sights on the bright opening to the right. I kept myself in a crouched position as I hastily made my way towards it, the horrid screech of the creature once again echoing through the walls of the expanse. Down here! One of the two women shouted, immediately making my heart sink, as I hoped and prayed they weren't referring to the hall that I was currently occupying. But of course, my hopes and wants meant nothing here. I immediately picked up speed, which was nothing in comparison to how quickly I began moving after hearing one of those female agents shout in my direction from the end of the hall behind me. Hey! Get back here! I of course had no intentions to obey her demand. Instead, I broke into a full-on sprint, not even taking a moment to waste on trying to convince them of my situation. I made a mad dash for the intersection as the woman began to open fire. Several bullets whipped by and missed me by mere inches, only causing my adrenaline to skyrocket, making me pump my legs like never before. After what felt like an eternity, I finally made it to the end and made a sudden and hard right turn. The woman had stopped firing at me, but cried out in a fury of both horror and rage. Gunfire then erupted through the walls as I heard the creature's dozens of footsteps as it closed in on the three agents. What is that? The man shouted, just before letting out an agonizing cry. I didn't dare to look back, but all I know is that things likely didn't go his way in the midst of encountering the beast up close. Their screams were haunting, and that coupled with the gunfire and the screeching of the creature made the situation all the more horrible. The sounds of flesh tearing didn't help. But at this point, I couldn't tell who was killing who. It was only when I was more than a couple hundred feet away, and my heartbeat slowed to a more reasonable speed, I had realized that my surroundings changed significantly. Instead of the soft thumping and squelching of moist carpet, my feet were hitting solid and dry tile. I slowed myself and looked down, only to now see a bright white tiled floor. It was pretty much what you'd find in your average public school building. And speaking of, when I glanced ahead of me, the hallway was no longer yellow. Instead, the walls to my immediate left and right consisted of tall blue lockers. Above those, was a simple white painted slant of wall that ran up into an equally boring and flat tiled ceiling. There was a gap in the lockers on the left wall, around 30 feet in front of me, so I went towards it, only to discover that said gap was actually a door. You'd think by now I'd have had my fill on anything to do with those. The door itself was made from a light polished wood, with a tall vertically thin window running up the middle. I peered into the glass laying eyes upon a classroom, one that looked to be abandoned. Had I made it out? Had I escaped the expanse a second time by some sheer dumb luck? Because when I looked behind me and saw the hallway, the yellow walls slowly faded into this new structure. The cutoff was sudden and easy to distinguish, dozens of feet of yellow wallpaper suddenly becoming a solid white and stopping right where the blue lockers began. It was obvious that this was a school or at least, an imitation of one. But I wasn't back in reality. I was still in the expanse. But obviously, 
this was some sort of different layer or section. Regardless, I don't know who actually left the encounter alive between those agents and the creature. I couldn't hear anything anymore with the distance I had put between all of them and myself. But I knew whoever survived would come looking for me, and I wanted nothing to do with either. I didn't want to keep standing out in the middle of the hallway and leave myself as an easy target. Part of me was forgetting the creature might not be the only one in here, and the gunfire going on earlier didn't help. So I put my hand on the doorknob and turned it. To my surprise, the door swung open with a slight creak. I stepped in and shut it behind me. I didn't see a lock of any kind though, so I instead went and pushed a couple of the students' desks up against it, hoping it would provide me with just a bit more peace of mind. While I could tell this place was abandoned, most of the supplies and actual material still looked mostly intact, save for the dust and little bits of moisture. Over on what I assumed to be the teacher's desk was a black cover notebook and a mug full of pens and pencils next to it. I went to approach it, only to stop dead in my tracks by the sound of sudden movement taking place just outside the door to the classroom. My heart froze, and I kept still. This movement wasn't a constant, abundant pitter-patter like the creature, and it was far too heavy to be human footsteps, so it had to be something I had yet to encounter. Once the initial terror passed over me, I immediately dropped low and maneuvered my way underneath the teacher's desk, letting my back rest against the thick, metallic tower of drawers that doubled as a support leg. I was fully hidden. I knew whatever it was wouldn't be able to see me. And yet, it didn't ease my nerves in the slightest. But how could it, especially when I picked up the faint yet potent sound of its heavy breaths coming through the door? It was looking through the window in the door, waiting for the slightest noise or hint of movement to occur. I had no idea what this thing even looked like, and I didn't want to. I kept holding my breath despite not needing to. Every second felt like an eternity. I got to a point where I thought my heart would explode. But then, I heard its monstrous footsteps once more as its heavy breath faded away, allowing me some emotional relief as I finally exhaled. It was leaving, losing interest after failing to pick up on my presence. I slowly picked my head around the support of the desk and glanced over at the window of the door, only to see that whatever it was was no longer there. But I still didn't want to leave the room, not for a while but I knew I'd have to eventually. I slowly slid out from underneath the desk and stood up, grabbing both the pen and the notebook placed on top of it before returning underneath the desk. I'm gonna write all of this down. I need this to reach someone, somewhere. I need to continue getting my story out there. If you all don't hear from me again, then I guess that means I didn't make it. But this needs to be exposed, and the world needs to know. Be careful where you step. Remain cautious of where you go. Because there are fates, a whole lot worse than death. And falling into the expanse is one of them. After looking through the classroom a bit more, I discovered an old backpack resting in the corner behind a desk. I picked it up, unzipped it, and looked through all the pouches for anything inside. There wasn't much of note besides dust and crumbs, however. I figured it would be a useful item to have with me, so I kept it with me, returned over to the teacher's desk, and grabbed the notebook and pen I had been using to document events. After which, I put them inside and set the backpack's straps over my shoulders, tightening them in the event I needed to move quickly to prevent it from easily falling off. I made my way to the door, before pushing away the desks I had used as barricades, the metal legs scraping against the floor, making me visibly cringe. Once they were moved aside, I approached the door, letting my face hover close to the glass as I looked out into the hallway. There was still no sign of whatever it was that had been breathing and making those footsteps, which was good. I needed to take the opportunity to get out of this room and keep moving before it came back. I took a deep breath, mentally preparing myself before I opened the door. 
The longer I stayed here, the less I felt like I would be able to escape. But I did it once before, and I can do it again. That much was comforting, but not a whole lot. I opened the door, taking my first steps back out into the imitation of a school hallway. It looked no different than before, until I looked to the right. Shockingly, the repetitive yellow wall area of the expanse that had led into the school layer was no longer. It was the exact same hallway I had run down when escaping from those mercenaries, soldiers, whatever you'd call them. But instead, at the end of the hall with the blue lockers lining the walls on either side was just a solid, plain white wall, and it was as smooth as a wall could possibly be. I was now met with another strange element to deal with, the fact that the expanse's layout and features seemed to change periodically without any true pattern or logic. At least, I think that was the case, unless I was truly losing my mind. I headed off to the left, turning down another hallway that maintained a consistent design in appearance as the one previously. Not to mention the other abandoned classrooms and even what looked to be a worn down computer lab with monitor screens being smashed and cracked along with some having fallen to the floor. I did give the lab a second glance, keeping a lookout for any computers and monitors that looked intact enough for me to try and use, but it was nothing more than self-amusement at that point. Even if there was one in working order, who's to say it would even obey the rules of a computer back in reality? After looking around for just a few minutes, I eventually gave up and headed deeper into the school. I pretty much came to terms with calling it that, despite obvious circumstances. Everything I had seen so far had been mostly uneventful, besides the fact of having myself on high alert in case whatever that thing was earlier circled back around. After mindlessly wandering for several more minutes, I eventually came to a staircase leading up to a supposed second floor. The stairs themselves looked unstable and dilapidated at best with what looked to be rust and rot running along the walls, accompanied by cracks with what looked to be weeds growing out of them. OSHA would have a field day with this place. Before going all in, I reached out with my right foot and placed it on the first step, half expecting it to collapse from just that minuscule amount of force. But it held, giving me just enough assurance to take another. And once I felt comfortable enough to begin climbing, I heard something that made my heart skip several beats. I stopped, frozen, as I leaned forward to keep myself out of line of sight from the staircase entrance. Coming from outside the doorway where the staircase was located were footsteps. Heavy but slow and potent footsteps. But not only that, there was the breathing as well. It was just as deep and hoarse as it was unsettling. The creature that was looking for me while I was hiding inside the classroom. It was coming. And there I was, just a sitting duck out in the open. I immediately started to move up the stairs as quietly as I could, skipping multiple steps and placing my feet down as lightly as humanly possible. Luckily, the padding on the bottom of my shoes was able to keep my movement on the quieter side of things, so I was able to be quick without making much noise. But it didn't feel like I was moving fast enough because every second counted, and with every one that passed, the louder the breathing and the footsteps became. Part of me wasn't even sure if I would make it to the top in time before the creature entered the stairwell. But I kept moving, kept pushing myself, because it was quite literally life or death. I was careful, making sure not to throw too much weight on any section of the stairs that looked too unstable. I kept my eyes on what was below me, Cautious not to slip up. But just as the breathing had reached the door frame, I was only on the last few steps, just feet away from the top. I was thinking every god that I could think of that I was going to make it without that thing seeing me. That is, until on the very last step, I slipped and my foot dislodged a chunk of material from it, sending it crashing down the staircase below me and breaking apart more and more with each step it collided with. The footsteps outside the stairwell suddenly ceased, and so did my movement. I held my breath, turning to look back down at the doorway. The silence was deafening, and I didn't dare move a muscle. 
Not yet. The creature, whatever it was, let out a slow, surprised snarl. I could hear it sniffling the air from outside the doorway. And that's when I seized the opportunity to more or less throw myself up to the top of the stairs. I landed as quietly as I could, just before looking up to see more or less a similar layout to the first floor. However, to my right was what looked to be the school library. I could hear the creature as it entered the stairwell and began climbing up at a moderate speed after me, so I turned and made a mad dash into the library to hide as it tailed me, still not getting a look at its appearance. The library itself looked just as abandoned and as dilapidated as the rest of the building. None of the shelves even had books, but I didn't have time to think about it. I frantically looked around for several seconds before laying eyes on what looked to be the circulation desk with an office behind it. I could hear that the creature was a little over halfway up the staircase and I was running out of time to find a place to hide. I quickly made my way around the circulation desk and pulled it for the door to the office behind it, praying with every fiber in my being that it wouldn't be locked. I threw my hand on the knob. Hearing that the entity was now at the top of the stairwell, it's breathing more rapid and almost angry in nature. I turned the knob, only for the door, to not budge at all. I tried again and again, finding no more success than my first desperate attempt. So I did the only thing that would save me from becoming a bloody smear on one of these walls. I crouched down and moved up against the desk. The top of it was offset just enough to hide me if the beast was to pick over. Speaking of which, I heard its breathing as it entered the library, its footsteps coming to a sudden stop as it seemed to sniff the air. I thought it was over right there and then, that it would detect my scent and kill me right on the spot. Yet, nothing came. Didn't stop my life from flashing before my eyes though. My cheeks were going red from holding my breath as the creature continued to stay idle and scan the library. Moments that felt like years passed. But the thing eventually lost interest, and I heard it turn and exit the library into the hallway from which it came. Although, it didn't go down the stairs, not according to my ears anyway. I waited for several minutes before I even dared to peek my head out in the open, cautiously lifting myself up and over the edge of the desk to take a look around. I was alone, or at least my eyes told me that I was, but I wasn't sure if I could even trust that at this point. Needed to keep my head on tight though. I quickly but quietly climbed over the desk before turning to my left and finding what looked to be an opening to the school gym on the opposite end of the library. And it was either that or going through the same doorway that thing just did mere minutes ago. I made the obvious choice and headed for the gym. It was of course dimly lit or looked to be that way from inside the library. But once I crossed the doorway, I got the full scope of its appearance. It was dilapidated just as the rest of this place was. That was expected. There were fluorescent lights hanging by a thread from the ceiling. The floor was abundantly cracked and dirty. The basketball hoop's backboards possessed only about half the glass they should, with the nets also being worn down and hanging halfway off the rim. It was a ridiculously large gym, much bigger than the one my school possessed, so every step I took made me feel like an ant walking across a king-sized bed. And despite the fact that I knew I was alone, I couldn't help the feeling of being watched. It made me speed up a bit, as well as taking a couple of glances around me for good measure. But I didn't hear or see anything that moved. Or maybe that was the problem. I got just less than halfway across the court. I came upon a certain section of worn down bleachers that appeared stained with mold, which led all the way up each step until it hit the wall. I took a look at the wall itself. That part was just above the top step of the bleachers, seeing that there was something written on it in what I assumed to be blood. Don't go in the water. It only raised more questions than answers, as there wasn't a drop of any actual water in sight. The ominous sentence had made me think about just how many other people had also gotten stuck in this part of the expanse and were never able to tell their stories. Decided it was best to leave the bleachers alone though. The less of the environment I involved myself with, the better. 
At this point, I was practically jogging toward the door. If there wasn't anything pursuing, nothing that I could hear or perceive in any way. But regardless of that fact, I still wanted to get the hell out of that area. I take one last look back, seeing the doors that I entered through from the library were now connected to what looked to be another dilapidated classroom. The expanse had changed its environment yet again. Part of me had pondered if it was possible or not to actually see the shifts occur. Nonetheless, I made it to the door and threw it open, only to step through and look up like a mesmerized child. This time, I found myself in a white, massive, and empty cafeteria. It was what you'd expect from a public school as far as the general decor and design. The scale of the room itself was a bit large, but not ridiculously so. Seems like every room in here was just slightly larger than it should have been. The long and rectangular dining tables were strewn about, with some being upside down or flipped around in various ways. They were also beaten to hell, with chunks of wood missing from some corners and sides. And that wasn't mentioning the cobwebs strung up in between the seats. And yet, there wasn't a single arachnid or insect to be found. The cafeteria had two hallways on either end acting as exits. I opted for the hallway on the left, as I had seen a couple of doors that had looked ajar. But what they actually led to was a mystery from the angle I was at. Everything seemed so lifeless. And yet, you were always under the impression that you were not alone. There were still no windows that allowed me to see what might be on the outside of all of this. Although part of me wondered if I'd look out and just see nothing but a black void. It had become more than clear to me at this point that I wasn't on earth anymore. Regardless, I made it to the opening of the hallway and immediately darted into the first open door I saw, reaching behind myself to slowly shut it as quietly as possible. This next room was probably the most normal out of everything I'd seen thus far, by the standards of the expanse anyway. It was a simple natatorium. It was on the bigger end of things as far as dimensions, like the rooms before it, but nothing that I hadn't seen in schools back on earth. And it was surprisingly sterile and intact looking, not nearly as worn and torn as the rest of the building. It had it all, the white and blue tiled floor, the diving boards, the lanes in the pool, and the potent smell of chlorine. Although it was a bit dimly lit, making it difficult to see what was beneath the surface of the water. However, on the edges of the pool were white rectangular signs that, on any other pool back in reality, would usually list the depths of a particular section. And this pool had those, except they didn't display any numbers or typical units of measurement. Instead, there was just the letter X painted in black ink on each one. I raised an eyebrow before shifting to the edge of the pool and peering over, the eerie silence only furthering tension that shouldn't have been present. Pretty much all natatorium pools usually allow you to see the bottom, but this one didn't, not even a little bit. I sat there puzzled as I focused hard and squinted my eyes to locate the floor of the pool. But the harder I tried, the more I only saw just an endless dark blue abyss. It looked to not even have a bottom at all, and if it did, it definitely wasn't anywhere near reasonable enough to swim to. And speaking of, I caught movement in the corner of my eye just as I was about to look away. It came closer to the right end of the pool, just about where my peripheral vision ended. The depth of the pool was consistent across the entire thing, even where you think it would have or should have been shallow. I turned my head to focus in on whatever it was. I squinted once again, spotting the black mass slowly inching toward my end of the pool. It had to be more than 30 feet in length alone, with the width being around 5. Three months ago, I would have assumed what I was seeing in that moment was nothing more than my eyes playing tricks on me. But now? Well now, I fully accepted that there was something down there. Something alive. And probably dangerous. So I did the most common sense thing I could. I turned around and made my way to walk right out of the natatorium. I didn't want to bother sticking around to find out any more information about whatever was swimming around down there. I didn't have the tools to do a damn thing about it anyway. But as soon as I had reached the door and put my hand on the knob, I froze. The breathing, the footsteps, 
I heard it again, and it was right outside the door. That thing, it was back, and this time, I finally caught a glimpse of its hideous appearance through the glass in the door. The creature wasn't very tall, just under six feet by my estimation, but that didn't do anything to take away from its grotesque nature, not even a little. Its body shape resembled that of an overweight human maintaining a bipedal stance as it walked. Its skin was a sickly gray color, with it looking like it had been forcibly stretched over the bones and muscles of the beast. Its face possessed not a single feature, giving it the appearance of a sheet of metal. Its most disturbing feature, however, was that of the two long and thin appendages protruding from its shoulders. They were bent at a near 90 degree angle about two feet out, both of them covered in these disgusting bumps that travel up the length of the appendages all the way to the bent section. The creature turned its faceless head and pointed it right at the glass in the door. Sure, it had no eyes, but I knew somehow, some way, it could see me clear as day. The breathing was still present and potent as well, despite the lack of a mouth. Everything about it was just wrong. And it was somehow even more horrific and hideous than the centipede creature. To say I was stuck between a rock and a hard place wasn't a stretch. My heartbeat skyrocketed as I thought of what to do. But it wouldn't matter all that much. I had taken too long to act, and it was going to cost me dearly if I didn't find a way out. The beast started moving toward the door, reaching out with those bumpy shoulder legs in order to presumably break it down. I quickly backed up and looked to my left, spotting a lone broom that was laid up against the wall. The creature began to pound on the door with its horrid limbs, and the hinges grew weaker with every blow, which meant my time was running out, and there wasn't anywhere to hide this time. I dotted over to the broom, swiping it away from the wall, and then breaking the handle over my knee to leave one sharp end. After which, I gripped the blunt end with my shaky fingers and held it behind my neck in the stance of a baseball batter. I didn't expect myself to be able to kill this thing, not even close. But if I lured it in, swung at it, and kept it from grabbing me long enough to where I could run around and exit the room, then that would be enough. It was all about whatever I had to do to survive at this point. The creature delivered several more devastating bangs to the door, the last one of which finally threw it right out of the frame and off its hinges, causing it to slide across the floor and into the pool, a small splash manifesting before it sank into the depths. The creature then raises those shoulder appendages as if to tell me it's about to charge, which it did violently dashing forward at a surprising speed considering its previous movement patterns. I evaded the beast by strafing to the left, my heart going a mile a minute as I worked up the courage to take a swing at it, landing a harsh blow on the back of its head. The beast retaliated by shooting out its left shoulder appendage straight from my head. I backed up so fast that I nearly slipped and fell as I raised the broom handle to block the attack. It then lunged with its other appendage so I sidestepped to the right and swung the handle down hard on the limb, hard enough to burst and draw blood from one of the bumps. The liquid itself was gooey and thick, a light grey color that seeped out from the supposed wound I had created. But this little stunt only angered the creature far beyond whatever point it was already at. It turned and charged with its entire mass again, catching me off guard and throwing me right off my feet with a powerful impact into the pool. It happened so fast that I didn't fully comprehend it, until I was already several feet on the water, having no time to take a breath or prepare myself. From what I saw when I opened my eyes, the creature itself didn't follow or fall in with me. The water itself was surprisingly warm, but that wasn't even close to enough to make me feel comfortable in my current predicament. I looked down, the black abyss staring right back up at me as I stared down at it. I could barely see my own feet as they were swallowed up by the immediate darkness below me. It was haunting and disorienting, like looking into a giant sinkhole. But unlike this abyss, sinkholes were at least somewhat understood. My lungs began to throb, 
but I was hesitant to swim up, knowing the beast would be waiting for me at the top. But at least I had a chance against that thing. Drowning? Not so much. I did manage to hold on to the broom handle though. Nonetheless, I quickly made my decision once I looked down to the right side of the pool and saw more movement in the water that was below me. This time, I could make out more of its shape. It resembled that of a serpent, but there almost weren't any details that I could get besides that. However, I could make out two brightly colored yellow dots in the depths. There was a couple of feet of distance between them. It was its eyes. They had to be. It saw me, and it was going to be coming right for me. I kicked hard as my lungs filled with water, desperately reaching up for the surface while I swam as hard as humanly possible. Once I broke the surface with a frantic splash, I spit up any water that had entered my mouth and threw my head back to look for the creature. It was gone, vanished from the position it was in when I was thrown into the water. I quickly looked around, left, right, and behind. Nothing. The entity was no longer in the room at all. It brought me a sense of relief I hadn't felt in months, not since I landed in the library. I didn't waste any time swimming over to the edge of the pool and pulling myself out with a coughing groan. The entire left side of my body felt as if it had been hit by an SUV, which I guess wasn't too far off. I got to my feet, looking down and spotting a trail of the creature's blood leading from where my feet were planted to the door and into the hallway adjacent to the natatorium. It retreated, but I didn't let myself get a big hit, thinking it ran because it was scared of me. It probably just thought I had perished. Regardless though, I knew it would be back, and I needed to move despite me being drenched and dripping wet. I tried to shake my head to get some of the water out of my hair. All of my clothes were soaked, and I felt heavy, the smell of chlorine all over me now. The backpack felt 10 pounds heavier with all the added weight of the water, and I wasn't sure if the notebook I had taken was any good anymore, but I didn't have any time to check at that moment. I paced over to the door and stopped just before actually stepping out to lean forward and look in both directions. The trail of gooey blood had led down the right end of the hall. So I instinctively went down to the left, taking the broom handle with me. My footsteps produced a bit of a squelching noise as I made my way down this new section of the school. Part of me considered taking them off in case something hurt me, but I knew I was far better off leaving them on. The hallway was what I expected, a narrow rectangular shape with classroom doors on either side. Nothing I hadn't seen before. So I continued on to find a place to sit down and regain myself for just a minute before I resumed wandering. There wasn't much to see in this particular area, just more corridors with lockers, doors, and tiled floors spread about. Although, after the death-defying adrenaline rush I had earlier, it was certainly a nice change of pace. I kept looking around for any flickering walls or strange doors, as it had been established to be my only hope for an exit at this point. The expanse didn't seem to abide by many rules, but if one thing was consistent, it was that flickering walls were either your worst nightmare or your saving grace. Now that most of my initial shock and existential dread of the expanse had worn off and mostly turned into general caution, I felt a sense of anger boiling inside of me at both myself the people who never listened to me, and Tiffany. But according to what those agents had said, she had already gotten what she deserved, both for what she did to me and probably countless others. Those armed agents dressed in black were a whole other question. Who were they? What did they want? Who sent them? Was it truly the government or something more sinister? After wandering for who knows how long, I got to a point where I had mostly dried off, giving me an opportunity to stop and take the backpack off in the middle of an empty hall. After unzipping it and reaching inside for the notebook, I was genuinely taken aback at what I saw. It was mostly intact and only slightly wet on both the back and cover. The backpack was heavily water resistant apparently. I opened the notebook up, rested my back against the wall on my left, and began to document everything that had taken place since leaving the classroom all the way up to the chase with the creature and the encounter in the natatorium. It felt beyond cathartic to once again get my story in writing 
in a morbid sort of way. There was still the off chance I didn't make it out of here alive for a second time, and I had somehow prepared myself for the fact that all the people who knew me back in the real world may never see me again. Missing persons cases are always haunting and terrible to endure, especially for close family members of the victims involved. But at least, when someone goes missing on Earth, there's a chance you could find them. There's trails they leave behind whether they want to or not. There's hope, even if it seems hopeless. But when someone goes missing, via falling into the expanse, there's nothing, no trails, and nearly no evidence. Not if you don't see it happen. It makes me wonder how many missing person cases exist solely because of this place. I didn't get much time to ponder on a potential answer though, as I picked up an all too familiar sound hitting my way. The footsteps, the loud, thundering footsteps, and the low, deep breathing. The creature was back, and was hitting my way one last time. It was coming from behind, in one of the adjacent halls. I slammed the notebook shut and threw it inside the backpack, quickly zipping it up as I put the straps on my shoulders, after which I reached down and hastily snatched the broom handle, gripping it tightly as I stood back up. I'm sure the fact that I smelled like chlorine only made it easier for the creature to track me down, the beast that could sniff you out without a nose. I prepared myself for the inevitable encounter, gripping the broom handle as I backed up slowly, waiting for the creature to turn the corner and charge me. This thing wasn't gonna leave me alone. It wasn't gonna give up and go away. It would keep coming for me until I took my last breath. And I had grown sick and tired of doing nothing but running. Running and hiding. I needed to defend myself and take a stand. The footsteps and breathing grew more potent. I held the broom handle behind my back, ready to swing. The creature rounded the corner, roaring in sheer rage and feral aggression. It was an understatement to say that the beast was not happy to see me. I was terrified. I thought about how this would be my potential end. That this thing would kill me, and that would be it. But as I said, I was done running. It let out another earth-shattering howl before charging at me. But I wasn't foolish enough to try and block him. So instead, I dashed to the side, nearly falling off my feet as I try to avoid the vicious attack. The creature doesn't waste time following up. It turns and charges again, throwing out the left shoulder limb it possessed and slamming me against the wall, my back stinging as I feel it impact the brick. I quickly take a swing at the creature's head with the broom handle, only briefly causing it to jerk to the side before snapping back as its featureless face stared me down. It raised its other limb up in the air, preparing to slam it down on me, so I quickly raised the broom handle and swatted it away. I followed up by then flipping the handle and shoving it forward, impaling the creature in the abdomen area. It cried out from the gruesome injury, flailing its limbs around in an animalistic rage as it swatted at me. I backed up to avoid the blows, nearly falling over in the process. I lunged forward and grabbed onto the broom handle before pushing forward on it, letting it impale the creature even deeper, avoiding another incoming swat from the beast's limp. It roars louder than ever before, the lack of a mouth doing nothing to hold back the ear-shattering volumes it could reach. The entity's blood flows out from the wound, coating several inches of the handle as it also runs down the body of the creature. I let go and backed up, watching it as it continues to go berserk. But it wasn't done, and it wouldn't go down. Not quite yet. It reached forward and yanked the handle out of the wound. The sound of both its pained growls and flesh tearing being coupled together. Once it's out, the entity then throws the handle several yards behind itself. It lands with a mocking thud on the floor of the hallway, now completely out of reach. The creature then snaps its hit at me sideways, and without a weapon of any kind, I didn't stand a chance. So I did the only thing I told myself I was done doing. I ran wasting no time turning and bolting down the hall. And with the creature now aware of my position, it revealed its true speed, taking off after me as I pumped my legs with adrenaline-induced vigor. The creature practically shook the ground as it chased after me. I fled down to the end of the current hall before making a hard left and heading down another, almost identical one. The creature was hot on my tail, seemingly not slowed down by its wound. 
I was sweating and panting like a dog as I kept sprinting forward. I thought that I'd be stuck in a mindless chase with this thing, one that would only end in my death once I ran out of stamina. And there was no part of me that was prepared for it. Surviving all of these experiences in the expanse, only to die like this and become another missing person's case in some random police database. But after looping around one hall and entering what looked to be a second cafeteria, I spotted something that I thought I'd never be so happy to see. On the wall at the opposite end of said cafeteria, there was a section of it that was just a bit darker than the rest and gave off a visually apparent flickering effect. Every bone in my body shrieked with both relief and terror as I felt the beast's presence just mere inches behind me. It was catching up. I had never run faster than I did right then and there, even in my previous escape from the expanse. Humans are capable of some extraordinary things when the threat of death is quite literally looming over them. Once I saw I was only a few feet away from the wall, I threw myself forward, not even thinking about what kind of environment I may have landed in. It was disorienting going through the wall at full speed, but it's not like I had the luxury of being able to slow down. I practically slid across the floor of the room on the other side. I was only given a fraction of a second to take in my surroundings. A complete white, sterile looking room with not a single stain on its walls that I could see. The creature had entered the room with an explosive entrance, charging and ramming me directly into the wall facing my back, all the wind immediately leaving my lungs as I desperately heaved for a breath. Slumping down to the floor as several objects I didn't visually perceive fell next to me on either side. The monster stood over me while letting out a triumphant cry, raising its left limb and bringing it down with an eruptive force, going clean through my shin and thigh as I screamed with the volume of a jet engine, scarlet red blood coating my socks and staining the floor beneath me. I writhed and thrashed around before whipping my head to the right and laying eyes upon a pistol on the floor next to me. I don't know where it came from or how it got there, but all I knew is that it was my saving grace. Divine intervention, whatever you want to call it. I clenched my teeth together so hard while reaching over, I thought they'd crack. I gripped the firearm, not getting a chance to switch the safety off, before the creature twisted its limb within my leg, provoking another horrific scream from my lungs. I quickly slid the safety off and pointed the barrel up at the creature's head, pulling the trigger twice and missing each time, the subsequent gunfire inducing it to thrash itself around and drag me along the floor only causing me further agony. I really thought that this might be it, that this might be the end. But no, I wouldn't go down like I was nothing more than easy prey. I finally come to a stop after all the thrashing and sliding, getting an opportunity to lift the pistol once more, my hands shaking as I aim and quickly pull the trigger. The bang erupts and the bullet tears right through the creature's throat, leaving a gaping hole that spewed out the grey blood. Its howls, or roars and cries were now gurgled, and its limb slipped out from my leg, causing me to bleed even more. It was nearly a small pool at that point. The creature's legs began to give out. It wasn't even focused on me anymore. It just stumped around before falling forward as it slowly bled, its blood now even mixing with mine as its body landed with a powerful thud. But it took less than a minute for the beast's cries to grow faint while it was on the ground. And soon, all movement ceased, and there it laid, finally dead, and no longer able to torment me. But I had a much bigger problem on my hands, one being the fact that I had lost enough blood to cover a mattress. I felt lightheaded, and I struggled to stay conscious. Part of me had wondered if I even made it out of the expanse, or just entered another section of it. That concern was quickly put to rest though, once I heard an alarm of all things. It blared into the room like it was coming through a PA system, a robotic female voice announcing the sentence. Level 5 security breach in armory. All possible agents engage. I managed to turn my head to the left with a groan, seeing that the wall I had been slammed into was lined with dozens of firearms, rifles, handguns, you name it. I laid my head flat on the ground. It started feeling too heavy as I was slipping into unconsciousness. 
outside the supposed door to the room were sets of footsteps, ones where you could tell they had on boots and other sorts of gear. A man's voice shouted saying, Come on, move it! This is a breach, damn it! Didn't have time to hear the rest. Before everything finally went black. I couldn't tell you how long I was out for, but when I woke, I was in a sort of medical bed with various wires and bandaging on my leg. I assumed I had been taken to a hospital, but I don't think most hospitals restrain your hands down to the armrests of the bed when you have a leg injury. I picked up two different voices in the midst of conversations, both male and female. I looked around the room for the sources which itself was lined with several beds on each wall with corresponding sets of medical equipment. My backpack was obviously gone, most likely confiscated by whoever occupied this place. I'm assuming that I was still in the same building. I dotted my eyes to the left, spotting a man and a woman of similar height, but differing in their attire. The woman was dressed in a suit and tie, her red hair thrown up in a professional bun. She looked to be in her early thirties, the man on the other hand was on the younger side, fitted in black military gear and armed to the teeth with a rifle in his hands. In fact, he was dressed and looked exactly like the agents who had supposedly killed Tiffany and shot at me inside the expanse. Who are you people? What am I doing here? I growl, fighting against my restraints with an effort that proved futile in its result. Seems like the kids got fighting him, more than the therapist did. He killed the thing we found him with in the armory. Came the man, a slight smirk on his face. Oh, I'm well aware. I reviewed the camera footage. Added the woman. He's a fighter. Can you answer my questions and stop pretending like I'm not here? I went on, quickly becoming frustrated. Hey, I'd be a little more grateful to the people who patched you up. Would have been a corpse floating in your own blood if it weren't for us. The woman replies. A surprising warmth to her tone, but I didn't fully trust it. Trust me, we're treating you a lot better than Side 12 would. If it were up to Ted, you wouldn't be awake right now to complain. The armed man chimes in. I heard of these so-called sights, and I assumed this to be one of them. You see, began the woman, my name is Sandra Locke, and I'm the director of operations around here. As you've seen, our job is not the most ordinary, and you've seen firsthand what we go up against. Hell, you killed a cryptid on your own. With the right training and mental conditioning, you could be a seriously talented field agent. Field agent? I thought, what is this? Recruitment of a kid into some shadowy military faction that kills beings from a mirror dimension? Had my life truly become this absurd in a matter of months? I was at a loss for words. So instead, I stuck to something a bit more tangible and easier for me to comprehend. Where's my backpack? And my notebook? I inquired, unsure of what tone to take at this point, despite me still being angry and confused. It's in our possession now, Sandra posits. So, what are you gonna do? Destroy it? Make sure not to leave a trace so then the world never knows what happened to me? I asked, rather rhetorically. No, quite the opposite. We want you to finish it, to write everything that has happened since you landed in the library up to now. No one already believes your story, but it'll raise suspicion if someone so hell-bent on exposing what everyone else knows as absurdity all of a sudden vanishes. At least this way, anyone who is stupid enough to take a serious interest will think you left according to your own delusions. I lay there silent, not sure how to respond. But I'll be honest, she made a decent point. One that reinforced what I was in denial about all this time. I tried everything to make people believe me, but nothing came of it. Not a single person came to my aid, even those whose very job was that. This is the first sort of actual hospitality I had received in months, even if there was a catch to it. Not to mention, the people around here had experienced things probably crazier than even me. I'd have the comfort of knowing that I'd be surrounded by people who could finally relate to me, even if it was in a pretty bureaucratic setting. You've seen things you're not supposed to, Sandra continued. Now, 
standard procedure would be to terminate you, but you've shown us that you're useful, and I'd much rather get your help than clean your brains off the floor. I started thinking about my parents, and as much as I had been angry with them for ignoring my concerns, I still loved them. What would they do if I simply up and vanished again? My parents are probably already heading to file a missing persons report for me right now. I shot back. You let us take care of that. And no, your parents will not be harmed. But after what you've seen here, we can't let you make contact with them again. Once again, who are you people? I grilled one last time. You'll learn about us as we go along, but I think it's pretty clear. We are the people who hunt things like the one you killed. The things that go bump in the night. Monsters, cryptids, whatever you call them, we exterminate them and keep them out of the knowledge of the public. This world would drown in chaos if it knew what truly lurked around every corner. Your therapist, for example, had to be eliminated. She was far too psychotic and would have been of no use to us. And I think we both know you don't exactly mourn her after she tried throwing you to the sharks. She would have drawn too much attention with her quite literally having a door to the expense, as you call it, right in her office. But you're different. You are indirectly throwing people off the trail, which is why we need you to finish what you started and join us. I can assure you that you will be well compensated for your work. There are many opportunities here at the agency. Wouldn't you like to be able to go back into the expanse one day with a fully armed team and kill everything in there that ever tormented you? And will torment or kill everyone else who ends up there? I'll be honest, her offer was intriguing. My instincts were all telling me to say no. But what choice did I have? Decline and die? Or accept and become some sort of monster-killing soldier? I'm not sure how much I wanted that kind of life. But I did, however, want to exterminate everything living inside the expanse. And maybe the expanse itself, if that was even possible. I wanted to avenge those who didn't make it out like me. Those who fell victim to that hell and never lived to tell the tale. Sure, I'd have to sacrifice my mission of getting the truth out to people. But if I destroyed the very threat that caused it in the first place, then it wouldn't even be necessary. So, I took a look at Sandra. And probably made the worst or best decision of my life. With a long, drown out exhale, I asked, When do I start training? <laughs>